Welcome, dear friends and colleagues. Welcome to 16th Belgrade International Architecture Week. I would like to say hello to all of you who are uh, not only in Belgrade, in our schools of architecture or schools where history archite or architecture uh, has been taught uh, in this city. I would like to welcome and say hello to all of our students who are uh, at the moment in uh, Iowa, in Boston, uh, in Scotland, and around the globe. Uh, this year, uh, uh, our uh, manifestation, our event, is focusing on housing, uh, one of the most uh, important topics uh, in, um, in uh, uh, Eastern Europe, if we consider uh, if we consider uh, Serbia and Belgrade Eastern Europe in the period after World War II, and we want uh, through this event uh, to promote the values of so-called Belgrade School of Housing uh, as opposed to contemporary trends in housing, which pretty much irritate all of us who studied uh, uh, at that time. Uh, so uh, the, the idea is uh, that uh, today we position that Belgrade School of Housing within some broader uh, international context. And that's why we invited uh, uh, speakers from abroad to give their insight. In the studio in Belgrade, uh, it's uh, me, uh, Tanya Conley, uh, who who, who's been teaching architecture history at MassArt Boston, and my colleague and friend, Vladimir Lojanica, uh, who teaches uh, uh, studio and, and, uh, and the problems of housing here at Belgrade uh, Faculty of Architecture. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be a part of, uh, of this conference today. And um, of course, uh, uh, I can just say that uh, the BINA is gaining uh, more and more popularity these days, more, more than ever before, I guess. Um, <clears throat> this is definitely due to the enormous um, efforts that uh, people organizing BINA are doing, you know, in terms of uh, uh, making this manifestation um, uh, widely spread. And, uh, and the second thing that I think that, uh, that's in focus now is that actually the topic of uh, this year's BINA, which is very interested not only to the professionals, but also to the general public, um, uh, since we are speaking about the residential architecture. So uh, without further ado, I would uh, really like to uh, thank you uh, to Mr. Florian Urban for joining us today and um, uh, in this conference. Um, so Florian Urban is a professor of architectural history and head of history of architectural and urban studies at Glasgow School of Art. He was born and raised in Munich, Germany and holds a Master of Fine Arts from the University of the Arts in Berlin and Master in Urban Planning from UCLA and PhD in History and Theory of Architecture from MIT. So uh, it's a great pleasure to welcome you here today, Florian. As you can see, I'm here in beautiful Scotland and weather that you only get once in a year. And in the background, you can see the Stirling Monument. So I'm in the city of Stirling. I got stuck in traffic, so I couldn't make it home. So, but Nonetheless, I'm very, very happy to give this lecture, which has a lot to do with the research that I've been doing in the last few years. So I'm going to share my screen now to give a short introduction into the topic of mass housing. Can you see it? Yes. Okay. Um, as uh, Vladimir has already said, I'm originally from Munich, from Germany. And I spent actually the first six years of my life in a standardized tower block. And it strikes me that these buildings are perhaps the most widespread typology of all times. But at the same time, no architectural type in history has roused comparable controversies. And these differences gave rise to my research project, Tower and Slab, which was published as a book in 2012. I looked at mass housing in six different cities, Berlin, Paris, 
um, Chicago, Moscow, Brasilia, Mumbai, and Shanghai. And I looked at the different narratives that were connected to mass housing in these different contexts. So in the book, I define mass housing not by size, not by technology and not by design, but by two ideological principles. And one was the principle of equal living standards, equality, and the other one of the belief in the state as a facilitator for these principles, state paternalism. These principles developed against the appalling conditions of the early industrial era. And I just want to point out that the original goals were not at a fulfilling everyday life or at producing a creative community or at democratic participation, but exclusively as providing light, air, water, and privacy. And with regard to these original goals, mass housing has been entirely successful almost everywhere in the world, not only in the much celebrated Siedlungen in Germany of the 1920s, but also in a lot of the buildings that later roused con considerably more controversy. In the bulk of mass housing was built in the era after the Second World War. In 1955, Nikita Khrushchev started his famous industrialization program, which was then imitated in most of Eastern Europe, but it was paralleled also by the social democratic visions in Western Europe. And this developed again against appalling conditions of the time. The average city dweller in the Soviet Union in the 1950s had seven square meters dwelling space per person. That is about it. Yeah, a little more than a king-size bed, possibly. Two king-size beds, I would say. So in the early 1960s, architects began to design what corresponds to the popular image of mass housing. These centrally planned, planned neighborhoods according to the principles of modernist urban planning. Functional separation, primacy of car traffic, etc. They were more standardized in Eastern Europe, but otherwise comparable in other countries as well. It developed against the background of the belief in progress and development in scientifically founded expert solutions. But the important point is that in the following, mass housing fared very differently. And the perceived success or the perceived failure often changed very abruptly. In some cases, it was a matter of only a few months. For example, the Märkisches Viertel in West Berlin stood first for progress and modernization, collective advancement, and for improved living standards. And then it came to mean the oppressive force of modernism, such as top-down planning, disenfranchisement of the individual, and the neglect of tradition. So I'm not going to get deeper what actually provoked this in this case, but just would like to point that this was paralleled in many other countries as well. In Glasgow, where I teach now, there was a similar development. The unloved council housing estate, Red Road Flat, was only demolished a few years ago. But then on the other side of the spectrum, you have the perceived success of a development such as this one. Mind the quotation marks of successful, because ob obviously it is according to what success means. And the success is rarely measured by the original goals because the presence of running water, central heating, and the absence of overcrowding are no longer perceived as success. But here we see an example for a cultural context in which modernist mass housing has never been demonized. There was no Pruitt Igo in Spain, no Sarcells, no Biomamir, no Vellingby. And modernist housing is well liked by all classes, including the wealthy middle classes. So this development was built in the 1980s and this is mostly a middle class development. So it was developed well after the big wave of bad reviews and it repeats all the difficulties of, the 19, of, of modernist housing. Functionalist design more or less, large development, etc., etc. It is still positively viewed. 
So these are fa plain functionalist buildings with spatial plans and have uh, the, 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 the development has about 30,000 inhabitants, almost 10% of the population of Valladolid. Nonetheless, no bad image. But there are also similarly, quote unquote, successful estates in Eastern Europe. So this one in Poland, Sari Zoliborskie, has all the advantages and disadvantages of a modernist development. It is quiet and full of light and greenery, but it is separated from the city center by large roads. So the probably most important why this is still positively viewed are citywide factors. First, Sadi Zoliborskie is located in a central, well-reputed neighborhood. And second, there is next to no alternative to modernist housing in Warsaw. As the city was comprehensively destroyed in the Second World War, there is still an extreme housing shortage. So even though these flats are small by today's standards, hardly anyone can afford to move out. So I could go on with context of successful mass housing, particularly if one looks beyond Europe. There are many contexts in which the very affluent live in functionalist blocks, as here in Cuff Parade or in Brilliant City. But my point is that it depended on particular cultural contexts and particular historical developments, whether or not mass housing was demonized. You can even also see differences in Europe. In some cases, the demonization caught on less than in others. Both of these examples, for example, are much criticized for their small flats, for their cheap construction quality, uh, but they're anything but ghettos. Most inhabitants don't belong to marginalized groups, and the inhabitants praise the central location and the access to services and public transport. So, what does then decide over perceived success and failure. So the bad news for architects is that the most important factors are being beyond the activity of the architect. It's not good versus bad design that had most influence on perceived success or failure. I would say possibly the most important factor is the urban context, whether central or peripheral, whether easy to reach, whether a desired or undesired neighborhood. Second, there are the alternatives, the availability of different forms of housing. In cities where almost all inhabitants live in some form of mass housing, as in Warsaw, there is no discussion. And this is also connected with the social status of the inhabitants, whether this is a poor neighborhood or a mixed or a wealthy neighborhood. And these things can obviously change. And they have much to do with housing policies both at a municipal level or at a national level, but they have little to do with the actual design of these buildings. But I don't want to go as far as to say that the design has no influence. I think architectural design is still influential once these other three, three aspects are taken care of. Uh, it appears to make a huge difference if mass housing is well designed. So thank you very much. I'll leave it here and I am looking forward to uh, your discussion with that. Uh, thank you very much, um, Florian. Uh, this, was, this was awesome. Thanks. Um, uh, 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 the idea is to, to have all our three guests first with their presentations and then we will save the questions uh, for, for later on for the open discussion. Uh, thanks again, and uh, I'll let Tanya now announce our next speaker. So our next speaker is Professor Kimberly Zarekor, uh, who teaches architecture in the College of Design at Iowa State University. Uh, mainly, she teaches uh, architecture history and design uh, since 2005. Uh, she holds her PhD in architecture from Columbia University and her historical research examines the cultural and technological history of architecture and urbanism in the former Czechoslovakia. Kimberly, let us hear your uh, understanding and presentation 
about, on this topic. Great. So, hello. Hopefully, everyone can hear me. And I'm going to share my screen. Hopefully, it's working. So, first of all, I want to thank everyone for inviting me. It's really a pleasure to speak to all of you across the ocean um, on a nice Saturday, beautiful spring Saturday. So, Tanya and the organizers asked me to talk about the experience of mass housing in Czechoslovakia, which is where I know the most. So I decided to stick with what I know in the sense that I'm going to talk in particular terms about Czechoslovakia, but a lot of what I have to say really fits nicely with what Florian uh, just presented. And in fact, some of my slides are the same places as Florian showed, which is an interesting uh, overlap that you will see. Oops. So I wanted to start by talking about my research and I wrote this book back in 2011 that was based on my dissertation and then was translated into Czech. And the research question driving my research was specific to Czechoslovakia because Czechoslovakia had this reputation in the interwar period in being a very special place. And so the question that I asked was given the strong presence and high quality of avant-garde architecture and design in Czechoslovakia before 1945, how, when, and why did prefabrication and standardized construction emerge as the dominant method for building construction? And Tanya, when I was reading your catalog text um, that goes with the BINA exhibition, I noticed that you made a comment in particular about Czechoslovakia and commenting essentially that the housing was better in the interwar period and was not so good after the war. And I, I guess my whole presentation, not, not because you made that comment, but my whole presentation is essentially a reflection on that because that's what drove my dissertation research was to ask that question. But my answer that I come to is different than the, the implication of your comments mm -hmm. um, because I think that the housing in Czechoslovakia was in particular there, a fulfillment of a modernist conception of what mass housing could be that was really a, a kind of fantasy uh, fulfillment based on the vision of the interwar period, fantasy in the sense that no one ever believed it would ever be possible to build at the scale mm -hmm. and for the number of people that the, the radical left in Czechoslovakia thought about in the interwar period. Um, and Czechoslovakia had a legal communist party starting in 1921, another uniqueness about the country. And its Marxist architects were very dedicated to the question of housing very early. And so I like to think about the continuity in the vision of housing from the interwar period into the postwar period, rather than a kind of break. And anyone who knows about my research knows this is one of my major themes. So I like to start with just this sort of index slide. And I was impressed, Tanya, with the format of your exhibition, which is similar in some ways to the way that I like to think about this, that there are evolutions over decades and that we can think about these different moments in time with housing as having particular characteristics and that they evolve. So there's not the monolith of mass housing. It's not one thing. So, <clears throat> For these kinds of housing endeavors, my thought about this, and this goes with what Florian was speaking about, there's an emphasis here on the collective good, of providing the minimum and then above the minimum quality of life for everyone, and that industrial production is necessary to scale up the number of units. So when I'm thinking about you know, what are the goals, um, Florian was talking about measures of success, I, I would also say that this is an interesting question, what makes a successful housing product or, or development? And th this is how I think about the goals. The goals are not set up the same way in a capitalist context that, than they are in the socialist context. And for me, this is one of the key things to understand about the comparisons between socialist and capitalist housing has more to do with what the goal is of the housing than the way that the housing looks. So in Czechoslovakia in the 1930s, you can see on the left, this is one of the very first social housing developments designed by architects who later would become part of, um, they, they would build famous things after the war, particularly uh, Hilski. And 
Yech also was somebody who was very involved with prefabrication. They won a municipal housing competition in the 30s. They built these apartments that are basically minimum dwellings um, at following the Siam model. After the war, Czechoslovakia has a communist government. The first mass housing production primarily is in a socialist realist style. And I write a lot about this in my book if you're interested in that particular moment. By the 1960s, the housing is more in the model of um, international style, high modernism, tower blocks interspersed with, with medium density. And I like this picture in particular. It shows a kind of beautiful aesthetic of these tall towers. Then by the 1970s, you have an increase in the number and the density of units, and you have this transformation in the construction processes to crane urbanism to a kind of mass production in which the quality of the facade, the differences in the components of the building facade are less differentiated. So they're, they become less beautiful, but they the scale is just impressive. So I am with Florian that, you know, the the actual production of housing here is always underestimated in terms of its um, effect on the population and then the number of people who get to live in modern housing. Okay, so I want to just start by saying that in Czechoslovakia, it's a very industrialized economy already in the interwar period. And this uh, prowess with industrial production comes into play after the war because Czechoslovakia is one of the first countries in the world that successfully moves to fully prefabricated housing construction. So on the left side, you can see a diagram from a textbook that I found in the National Library in Prague showing the four stages of construction, starting with massive block construction, working with prefabricated skeleton pieces and finally the most prized kind of construction was when there's no structural skeleton so the reinforcing steel that holds the building together is embedded in the panels and then the panels themselves are structural so it's a system that leaves little flexibility because you have just these wall panels for the floors ceilings and facades and partitions in these early buildings and the cover of my book is here on the right side this is one of the first developments of fully prefabricated panel block housing. These buildings, like I said, have no skeleton. Every panel is structural and they look in some ways to our eye like a house of cards. You know, every piece is, is part of the uh, construction. And the big gantry crane is critical to this technology. The scale shift happens a little later. This is the construction of Petržalka, uh, which is now in Slovakia in the 1980s. And this development shows how the height of the buildings increased, how the density of the buildings increased, uh, the, the buildings themselves are very large. And this is crane urbanism in which the buildings end up constructed sort of in a line based on the path of the crane. And so the development scales up from feeling as if each building is part of an urban ensemble and it scales up into more of a networked model in which the entire development is made up of a series of lines and nodes um, and you start to see the influence i think also of team 10 and, and different things that happen in the 1960s in which not only communist architects but also capitalist architects are interested in this shifting scale to something bigger I just want us to uh, you know, key this to what was happening in the 30s. Um, I already started to say this, but Carl Teige, the famous Czech critic, wrote this amazing book called Ne Menschi Bits, The Minimum Dwelling in 1932, which about 20 years ago was fully translated into English. So if anyone's interested in reading this book, it exists in English. And it's an amazing text on the housing crisis in Europe. I think it's underappreciated the, the depth of detail and the argument that Tygen makes, which is that the housing crisis cannot be overcome through the real estate market. Um, and I think this now is a, an argument that people understand, but he puts it in extremely detailed and kind of stark terms to say, you're never gonna solve this problem if you leave it to the capitalists, essentially. He also is part of a group that gets the housing question text translated to Czech, uh, which is from the 1870s. And here is the 1932 edition of that book. 
Um, and then also one of his collaborators publishes a book in 1946 that has on the cover an image of what becomes known as the living core. And this is the, the um, all of the things you need for life, cooking, so the kitchen, bathing, the bathtub, and then the toilet and the shower, it's all in a box that goes in the center of the unit. And then the housing is kind of, the living spaces are arranged around it. You can see the, the living core as it's called in the center of this drawing on the cover of the book. And this is a critical innovation to understand that every unit needs one of these boxes, which holds the things that you need to live. And then the mass housing becomes a series of these boxes with varying scales of living spaces um, around them. So a bigger apartment still only needs one living core, if that makes sense, just has extra bedrooms basically. Mm -hmm. So why did Czech and Slovak architects build Panalox? So they were looking for a solution for the housing shortages, especially in areas with new industries. They needed cheap, efficient, and fast construction. They wanted to extend the construction season through the winter and prefabrication was important. Um, the standardization and typification of design types worked well in a planned economy. So the five-year plan could, could plan for the amount of building materials that you needed. And to Florian's point, the, ideologically, these standardized units followed an ethos that all people would have equal access to housing. So an engineer might live next to a teacher or a tram driver or a coal miner. And this was part of the thinking about the housing. These Panalox offered a minimum standard quality of life to the largest number of people at the lowest cost. So in that, that's one measure of success, as, as Florin was saying. In the Czech Republic, there's currently 80,000 Panalox panel buildings that have over a million apartments. And overall, about 30% of the Czech population lives still in a Panalox. So this, um, the amount of housing, the success of, of housing people in these modern buildings is a huge legacy of the communist years. So I, I know I'm talking too long, so I'm gonna run through the remainder of my slides uh, a little bit more quickly. I want to frame the, you know, this goes to Florian's presentation too. I wanna claim the, um, frame the question of success and also aspiration in an American context as well. So as an American coming to the topic of mass housing, it was hard for me to wrap my mind around the aspiration to live in a prefabricated panel building because I had been culturally indoctrinated as an American to believe that the single family house is the greatest sign of success and that that is the standard for a good quality of life. And I think it's helpful for students in particular to think about how they now frame for themselves what a quality living environment looks like. And the single family house has kind of traveled around the world as a, as a model, but for ecological reasons, for climate crisis reasons, for uh, questions of mass tr uh, public transportation, we are seeing, I think, a return to a more dense model. But starting in the 1950s, this view of Levittown, for example, the famous American, uh, these houses, in fact, are prefabricated. They're, they're a mass production themselves, but each house is on its own individual piece of land. What I like to say is that this vision in a capitalist 1950s United States is really the same as this vision of early communist housing in Czechoslovakia, it's the same aspiration to offer young families, young professionals, good quality modern housing and a good quality of life with services nearby. Schools, places to shop, a health clinic, places for recreation. This is called Bielski Les. For a while it was called Stalingrad, this neighborhood. And it had all of these components in it right at the same time that Levittown is being built. What happens over time is a scale shift so that first 1950s vision of the five story high small blocks that are arranged around a green space that have a nice uh, sort of central space for all the services. This transforms by the 1970s and 80s into very large scale construction. And so um, this matches more with what Florian was showing in the other parts of the world. And for me, it's important to understand that the aspirations and the vision of socialist housing they, it changed over time. So we, we can 
I think we see the 1950s vision has really high quality to it and it gets a bit out of control when there's not maintenance, there's not good public spaces later in the construction periods. This picture I'm showing you is from right now and they've completely redone the public spaces and all the buildings have been refurbished so it looks a lot better um, and that's another part of the story. So for example these visions of children living in mass housing we have on the left the Americans living in their little prefabricated boxes and we have the Czechs on the right living in their prefabricated towers and it's important for me for everyone to think about the fact that the goals in some sense were the same which was was to offer a new vision for modern living that was um, together with the modernizing program of the government. Um, and I think it helps us to kind of see similarities and differences. So as Florian said, this is an international movement to build the towers, to build more mass dense housing. We can see here what was the Soviet Union in Tallinn, Estonia, Mustame, Balta Abba and Bucharest. But I also have here Valenby, which Florian talked about, and the French suburbs, the Banlieu. And what I wanted to say about this is that the form of the housing in these cases does not match with other aspects of the aspirations. Some of these districts, like the French Banlieu, were a process of social segregation of populations that were less desirable, that were sent out to the edges. And of course, this is not the initial goal, but it is how it happened, that these became more segregated, they became more distinct, and there's a stigmatization of the population. Valenby in Sweden, in Sweden is not like that, but it also was always built with better amenities and more bigger and nicer apartments. We also can look at Hong Kong and say there is a place in the world and Singapore is similar that has a lot of publicly funded mass housing. And it works for the reasons that Florian talked about. It's also the cultural expectation that a high rise is a form of luxury in this context rather than a sign of something that's a stigma. So very quickly, just some beautiful examples of Czech housing. Here is Pankratz from the 1960s. This is the early high modernism. Nova Dvorska has beautiful um, art and water uh, sort of interspersed with the buildings which have these towers and also these longer buildings and lower buildings and it's a beautiful ensemble um, in this neighborhood. Kirch uh, that I showed you before, these very tower, you know, pointed towers that have, you can see space on the roof, they look very much like high-end luxury living, but over time the quality degrades because there's very little maintenance that happens. Ostrava Poruba, this is another version uh, in a more provincial city from around 1970, where you see taller buildings but not towers. This is South City more recently. Um, it has a shopping street embedded in here. Um, and again, it's a community oriented design so that the buildings become part of a lifestyle. Each building's not on its own, but they're now has been re-inhabited with modern shops and you can get a latte and you can buy fancy stuff in these little shops. It's a really interesting evolution of this place. Here's Petrozelka, the crane urbanism city that is about one third of all of the residents in Bratislava live in Petrozelka across from the historic city center. And this is where for me, the drive to go tall, the drive for mass standardization leaves the buildings with less architectural quality on their own. And this is what Petrozelka looks like now. I've written a little bit about all these colors. Um, this, the grayness has transformed in something that looks more like a rainbow. And there is also the integration now of high-end shopping and, and sort of luxury amenities that now makes this neighborhood very desirable. I think New Belgrade is probably having a similar situation happening, which is that what were public spaces, public amenities, things for the common good have been privatized and turned into nodes of capitalism. And it's very easy because the housing is a kind of floating piece within that environment that itself is now privatized. And so these, are, these can hook into that housing network um, very easily. So I will stop there. Um, and look forward to questions. Thank you. Thank you, Kimberly. We are going to uh, continue our debate about Czechoslovakia and Belgrade School of Housing 
and uh, trying to put everything uh, in, uh, in some broader context. But uh, before that, we are going to introduce yeah, okay. <clears throat> okay. It's um, uh, again, it's a great pleasure to, uh, for me to to be able to introduce our next guest speaker. Uh, this is Vladimir Kulic. Uh, he has his um, uh, PhD in architecture. Historian. He's a historian, curator, and critics, and associate professor at the College of Design, Iowa State University. Um, on, on this point, I would like to mention that also he, uh, with his education, originated from the Faculty of Architecture, University of Belgrade. Um, uh, he's basically one of the of the most uh, uh, famous uh, recent um, uh, 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 achievements was that he was a co-curator of the exhibition towards the Concrete Utopia architecture in Yugoslavia between 1948 and 1980 at the Museum of Modern Art in New York. So, Vlada, please. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, Tanya and Vladimir, for in the introduction, for uh, inviting me. It's a really pleasure to be home, in a way. <laughs> Uh, even uh, if it's uh, remotely, uh, it's part of our Zoom life, I guess, uh, these days. Uh, but uh, let's hope that uh, we actually get to see each other uh, uh, in person sometime uh, soon. Uh, I um, uh, responded uh, to the prompt that uh, came to me by uh, trying to uh, engage uh, uh, with uh, this question of, of the Belgrade School of Housing or Belgrade School of Residential uh, Architecture uh, the, the, in response to the two kinds of audience uh, that, that uh, I imagine we have here today, uh, uh, a lot of local audience, including the hosts who are very knowledgeable about it. Uh, and then also uh, our guests from uh, uh, elsewhere uh, for whom this might be uh, sort of an unknown uh, phenomenon. So I'm going to try to sort of, uh, 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 address both of these audiences at the, at the same time by, by trying to define what this Belgrade school meant, right? Uh, and at the same time, try to uh, um, offer a different uh, or perhaps a, a fresh uh, a new view for for those who are knowledgeable about it, uh, and uh, that might allow us to situate the significance of the Belgrade School in the wider context of uh, modernist uh, architecture. So I'm very very grateful to Florian and Tanya, uh, sorry uh, Kimberly for uh, their uh, previous uh, 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 presentations because they they provide a great framework for me to plug. Uh, uh, my presentation uh, into the uh, wider uh, global story of mass housing after uh, World War II. Uh, so let me share my screen. Okay. Um, Zoom is not showing me the button. Okay, yes. Uh, you can see my screen, I hope. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, let's uh, then uh, start uh, with uh, my uh, presentation. Uh, what, what is this Belgrade school, right? Uh, it's obviously not a school, right? It's uh, uh, like uh, uh, literally institutionally, right? The, the Faculty of Architecture of, of the University of Belgrade was a part of it, but uh, this Belgrade school that we talk about uh, was something more than that. And I wanted to uh, propose that maybe we should look at it um, uh, as uh, something that I'd, I'd like to call the design ecosystem uh, and, and a very decentralized uh, design uh, ecosystem that consisted of many different institutions and agents. I think Kimberly will have something to say in this respect because she studied a lot the uh, organization of the architectural profession uh, in socialism, especially specifically in, in Czechoslovakia. And I'm bringing this up in order to uh, to highlight the, the, the possible differences in uh, the uh, wider social and economic mechanisms that produced this um, uh, design ecosystem. What do, what do I mean by this, this uh, uh, ecosystem? Uh, I would say it, it was a conglomerate, sort of an, an assemblage of uh, various uh, educational and research institutions. And please, uh, this is what I'm showing on the screen are just 
examples of some of the most important of, of these actors. Uh, there's, there were a lot more, so this is not an exhaustive uh, catalog, right? From the Faculty of Architecture, uh, Institute for, for Architecture and Urbanism, uh, famously the Institute uh, for Material Testing and its housing center, etc. So uh, that's one layer. The next layer would be uh, clients, a very specific network of, of clients, uh, including self-managing communities, and very importantly, the Yugoslav People's Army, which also in some ways was a contributor to uh, the, uh, research and, and, and education, having its own uh, research uh, um, uh, un and design uh, unit. The next layer would be uh, design and construction companies, right, various uh, enterprises that uh, implemented uh, the results of research and the, and the needs of, of clients uh, into, into practice. Then we have uh, the important role played by professional organizations, uh, including uh, the organizers uh, of, of Belgrade uh, Architecture Week, right, the, the Association of Belgrade Architects, uh, who uh, facilitated uh, the organization of the prime vehicle for how this knowledge that was created was disseminated in practice. And these were public competitions. Uh, the vast majority of large scale important uh, housing projects in Belgrade, but pretty much in, in most of Yugoslavia were uh, uh, very commonly uh, put to public uh, competitions, which, which sort of opened the, um, uh, the design to, to a variety of, of uh, views. And these public competitions ultimately uh, allowed the, uh, the density of research right, to, to be uh, put into practice. And finally, last but not least, on the contrary, uh, were the in various individual architects who, who specialized uh, in this uh, type of uh, architecture. And here's just the sample of the most famous uh, people, uh, whether uh, um, kind of important uh, figures like uh, Mate Bailon, who started the discussion uh, of uh, housing at the Faculty of Architecture already in the in the uh, 50s, uh, to uh, practitioners, uh, including Vladimir's own, own father, my, my professor Leonica, um, uh, who very interestingly floated in some ways between these different institutional uh, frameworks. And very often they worked in teams where different members of the teams belonged to different, different uh, institutions. So it was in many ways a complex uh, and, and uh, densely intertwined ecosystem where different parts of, of, the, of the system interacted uh, to a great deal. This uh, design ecosystem produced a vast amount of uh, its own uh, knowledge, which was widely disseminated and published. And I understand that this legendary issue of the journal Archi uh, Architectura Urbanism that you see on uh, the right uh, is being reissued now, right, to my, to my absolute uh, delight. Um, so there was there was the knowledge uh, dissemination component. There was a very kind of uh, important uh, material base in the in the technological uh, side of uh, the, the the construction. Right, there were homegrown uh, construction systems, uh, most famously MS uh, uh which was which was locally patented uh, and uh, very unusually was not a large panel system, but a pre-stressed uh, skeletal system. Uh, that that uh, underlay uh, a great deal of the most iconic, most famous of the of the um, products of the Belgrade School of uh, Housing uh, Architecture. So, um, what would be the product of this of this Belgrade School? Um, uh, both Florian and Kimberly talked a lot about about uh, the wider uh, urban organization and conceptualization of uh, mass housing uh, projects uh, all over the world, right? Whether in the socialist world or or, or in the capitalist world, uh, and if we look at uh, the, uh, the the urban concepts, if we if we look at uh, formal expression. Uh, I would say that there is not a single defining feature of Belgrade uh, School of Residential Architecture because uh, to, to uh, kind of uh, uh, continue along the same lines as, as the previous speakers, there was a very, very uh, uh, obvious evolution, right, from the high modernist uh, examples uh, from of the uh, late 50s and uh, early 60s 
to uh, uh, more brutalist manifestations in the late 60s, early 70s, uh, to um, attempts to engage with an appeal to traditional forms of, of architecture and different forms of, of urbanity uh, here in, in, in Block 19A. Uh, uh, in, in New Belgrade with this raised platform and then this, this sort of hint of, of uh, vernacular uh, architecture from central Serbia uh, to the, the, the famed return uh, to the traditional street, right, that uh, started actually was in, in many ways uh, inspired by uh, 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 Split 3, but was beautifully implemented in a very different way uh, in uh, Cerak Vinogradi. So uh, uh, what I tried to say with uh, uh, just this very kind of breathless, quick uh, uh, view through uh, these most famous, most iconic examples is uh, that uh, visually and urbanistically, uh, we see a great variety of, uh, uh, of expressions, of, of uh, motivations, of organizational systems, uh, et cetera. So it would be very difficult to anchor what Belgrade School means in this sense. As a side note, I think the evolution is also very interesting in response to what Kimberly was saying in the case of Czechoslovakia, because it was the opposite. Rather than uh, uh, becoming larger and larger and taller and taller, as was the case in, in Czechoslovakia, buildings became Small, lower and, and uh, uh, kind of deliberately more intimate, which was a, an interesting uh, uh, dimension, I think, that, that reflected this great deal of um, uh, thinking about, about what, what, what it means to create a humane uh, environment. Uh, however, there is one thing that connects all of these very different uh, examples of mass housing architecture. And that is uh, the apartment design. What ties together the entire uh, uh, Belgrade School of uh, uh, Residential Architecture is uh, the so-called Belgrade apartment, which was its uh, product. It's the ultimate product of uh, this, this design uh, ecosystem. It may be uh, self-evident to uh, local audiences, right to the point of being trivial, but it's not a trivial point at all because uh, the amount of design thinking that went into, into uh, the experimentation, the research with apartment plans in, in Belgrade was quite unique, I want to argue, on a global scale. Unlike other parts of Eastern Europe, apartments in Yugoslavia were never standardized, which produced a great variety of, of, of plans. Uh, but very interestingly, in capitalist countries, you know, and I have now 20 years of, of experience of living in the United States, uh, uh, the, uh, curiously, the market also gets to standardize apartment plans. So in my 20 years in the United States, I have lived in, in apartments that had very similar, almost identical uh, layouts, uh, whether it was in Texas or Florida or in New York or, or uh, uh, Washington, D.C. or, or uh, here in uh, Iowa. Uh, and uh, in contrast, what uh, the, the Belgrade School of Residential Architecture produced was something quite different, was a tremendous uh, a, a variety of apartment plans that were very, very deliberately uh, uh, designed uh, with very uh, 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 deliberate motivations that transcended those minimum dwelling requirements, right? Um, from the 1950s until pretty much the collapse of Yugoslavia, uh, the, the intensity of uh, kind of exploring the combinatorics of how to organize an apartment plan, I would say it was one of the key uh, motivations, one of the key tasks for architecture, especially uh, in Belgrade, whether, you know, there were students starting their, their education uh, uh, at the Faculty of Architecture, here we see uh, some examples, uh, whether uh, practitioners uh, working uh, 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 on, on actual real life uh, projects, here we see uh, uh, the uh, sketches by Alexander Stepanovich for, for Block 23. Uh, here's an article from uh, Professor Leonitsa uh, 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 where uh, this combinatorics of plans in relationship to, to the skeletal system is, is explored. Uh, uh, again, uh, variations of plans for, for, the same, they, uh, for the same project here uh, in, as applied in practice. Uh, 
there was even a push to make apartment plans uh, flexible, right? Which is which is uh, a very unusual. Again, I would say in uh, global uh, terms, uh, by the 1970s uh, we see this this uh, intense exploration that uh, uh, with uh, or uh, uh, research into the changing structure of, of families and the ways to uh, accommodate. Uh, families as they expand or contract, uh, and, we, and and that became one of the uh, uh, fields of, of research for for architects, uh, which signified a fundamental shift from that uh, those famed ideals, modernist ideals of standardization and typification, to something that we might call mass customization, right? And this is where we could perhaps even talk about. Uh, the Yugoslav shift to its own form of postmodernity rather than than uh, kind of the uh, uh, modern uh, ideals of, of high uh, modernism. To the point that architects like Milena Marosic in particular uh, uh, was so dead were so dedicated to to customizing these apartments that they even even uh, uh, conducted post occupation studies. We see this in the case of of Serak Vinogradi, where uh, uh, she worked directly with inhabitants to help them uh, um, uh, adjust and and adapt their their apartments to uh, the, the 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 varied needs of individual uh, uh, families. How did uh, the architect? How did this this uh, e design ecosystem define this apartment, Belgrade, Belgrade apartment? So the self perception, right? This is what what was theorized at the time, and that was constantly, constantly sort of uh, explored and and branded as an achievement. Were two uh, specific uh, features that are common to uh, a great deal of these various products of, of apartment designs. Uh, one is uh, the so-called extended circulation, or as it was uh, in the Croatian, Proširena Komunikacija. And the other one was roundabout uh, uh, circulation, or Kružna Veza. Uh, and here we see in the example uh, of this, this really uh, incredibly elegant apartment in Novi Sad, um, in Liman 3, uh, we see first what this expanded circulation means, right? It's the central space uh, at the core of the apartment, uh, which is not exactly an enclosed box, an enclosed room, but uh, is a sort of a circulation space that becomes sort of the, the symbolic heart of the apartment that's usually occupied by uh, the uh, dining table, right? We could, you know, because of the symbolic dimension of, of, uh, the, of the dining table for uh, the, the feeling of the domesticity, we could even argue that this is sort of the Belgrade school version of, I don't know, Frank Lloyd Wright's attention not, uh, to, the, to the fireplace as the, as the, as the symbol of, of uh, domesticity. The second uh, key feature is the so-called roundabout circulation. I picked this apartment uh, in particular because uh, this roundabout circulation, right, is, is really in some ways pushed to its extreme in this plan because it occurs, it loops, right? The, uh, the inhabitants are able to ambulate uh, through, through the, impart, uh, the apartment unobstructed uh, in many different ways, right? We see these, these three interlinked uh, loops. So you can imagine children running through the apartment, right, unobstructed in me, uh, uh, pursuing many, many different uh, 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 paths. Um, from the topological point of view, right, we could play mathematicians for, for a second and, and, and think about uh, sort of the topology. There's a great deal of, of, uh, of, of, of uh, topological complexity to, to this plan simply because of uh, these these open ambulating roundabout roundabout uh, paths, uh, in some ways, what this roundabout circulation led to was again to bring up uh, Frank Lloyd Wright is 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 that 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 kind of concept of the destruction of the box, right? That's that's something that Frank Lloyd Wright uh, pioneered in the late nineteenth century. The idea that uh, an interior space is no longer a clear box. That has four walls, right? But is is uh, something a lot more ambiguous and al allows for different different uh, circulation to occur uh, in the in the apartment. Um, but if we pay close attention to circulation, we will also notice something very very unique. And that uh, if you uh, uh, um, 
uh, try to measure the space that's allowed to, uh, for, for the circulation, uh, it is never much larger than what the minimum uh, requirements uh, uh, that, that uh, allow, right? Uh, so all of these different paths are between uh, 70 and 90 centimeters uh, in width, right? This is sort of that functions minimum that allows one person to to uh, uh, comfortably uh, pass through, and the uh, which ultimately leads to uh, relatively modest uh, uh, sizes of the apartments, right? This is where we start seeing the, the, the uh, two uh, sort of conflicting motivations becoming uh, synthesized, which is uh, this, this sense of openness, right? And, and, and uh, um, uh, 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 space that, that acquires its symbolic dimensions and allows, allows free movement. And yet still the need to stay within the constraints of of uh, social housing right of of the need to to provide for the for uh the uh largest uh largest uh number um i would say this is sort of a manifestation of a very rigorous functionalism right which uh took uh, into account the placement of every single piece of furniture and uh that allowed to uh the the inhabitants residents to furnish their apartments very very easily because it becomes very obvious what uh, what furniture should go go uh where uh and yet despite these very sort of functionalist uh limitations the the uh perception of the apartment is also uh uh, uh kind of contradicts that uh note how the circulation lines are always aligned with windows, right? So uh, whether we enter the apartment uh, and have this long view towards the balcony, or uh, whether we look in the opposite direction, perpendicular direction from the living room all the way across the apartment, there's always an opening at the at the uh, other end, which uh, kind of uh, visually, psychologically opens the the box in yet in yet another way. And the sense of constraint is. Uh, much less uh, uh, present than would normally be the, the, the case. So the box, that kind of uh, a typical architectural box, uh, again, uh, is, is sort of uh, deconstructed. And we see that over and over again, right? Here's an example from Tzerak Vinogradi, uh, where, again, we have this obsessive looping through through the apartment right this constant ambulation uh, through the apartment is is present again also rigorous uh, minimal circulation but also open views uh, through the apartment same story here very different plan note how different this plan is from the ones that we've seen before right i think kimberly is going to respond to this uh, well, because she wrote about the standardization of, of uh, apartment plans in Czechoslovakia. That is something that has been also written about uh, uh, in other contexts, right? In, in, in the, for example, in the context of, of the Soviet uh, Union, uh, our colleague Stephen Harris wrote about this uh, and made, made this beautiful argument about how uh, Soviet architects uh, designed uh, apartment plans in direct response to uh, bureaucratic uh, um, uh, constraints of, of uh, making sure that, uh, for example, uh, the apartment cannot be split between multiple families, right? This is a very different motivation from the motivations uh, that we see here, right? Where psychological needs of uh, the sense of openness, right? Whether visually or physically from ambulation are, are taken, taken uh, into account. Uh, I want to translate this sort of self-perception of, of the Belgrade apartment as uh, roundabout circulation, extended circulation uh, into kind of more and wider sort of terms of, of modernist architecture and to argue that what actually defines Belgrade apartment and what makes it largely unique in the global uh, sense is the unlikely combination of the of two modernist tropes right two modernist two sort of key features of modernist architecture which is the open plan and rigorous functionalism right both of these are embedded into the the the, the, the core principles of of modernism and yet what is uh, what we very very easily often overlook is that these two do not quite blend together Right, because if you try to create open plan, uh, it's very difficult to enforce minimum dwelling uh, standards 
uh, and uh, minimum dwelling apartments very often end up being just clusters of little individual boxes where the sense of open space uh, does not quite work. Let's look at, for example, very famously two projects by, by Miss van der Rohe, right? Uh, 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 almost exact same time, right? On the left is the Villa Tugendhat, one of the most celebrated examples of the uh, open plan where we see this, this uh, living level Right with the dining and living room and, and study and, 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 and the garden, right, uh, defined through uh, these sort of free floating partitions, and you can ambulate freely through space, right? The sense of, of flowing space, right, is, is very, very uh, uh, clear. What we see on the right is the almost contemporaneous project for an apartment building in Weissenhof, right, where plans uh, are on a much uh, a more modest standard, even though the, these apartments are considerably bigger than what was possible to build in, in Belgrade at the time. And yet the, the sense of openness and free ambulation uh, that architecture defines is no longer uh, possible, right? The rooms go back to being individual enclosed uh, boxes and, and the, this, this sense of, of space sort of dissolving into this free form uh, configuration is is no longer uh, really uh, present. Obviously, you know th these both of these these uh, motivations were embedded in the thinking of of architects, right? This is famous. This is the Bible, right? Of, of of every architecture student in Yugoslavia. This is how I started my education uh, uh, in the first year in in college. Uh, in the 1980s by uh, studying the uh, 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 amount of space that was literally the first exercise that we had by studying the amount of space that you need to sit at the desk, right, or to to uh, to uh, uh, pass through um, uh, the apartment or to to lie uh, in uh, the bed. That is very different, for example, to how we uh, start architecture education in the United States, right, which follows that more kind of uh, Bauhaus model where students start with abstract uh, uh, exercises in uh, form and space, two and three, uh, two and three dimensional compositions, uh, etc. So this fu functionalist mindset was deeply embedded in the architectural thinking from the start of the architectural uh, education. But architects also very clearly thought about spatial effects, right? These are, these are two uh, really beautiful drawings by, by Darko Marusic for apartments in, in uh, 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 the never built project for, for a block uh, 30, right? It was eventually built according to, to uh, kind of uh, different, more modest uh, standards. But we see this, this sense of openness, these sort of right and diagonal views, right, very, very clearly uh, uh, directed vistas, very consciously explored in these, in these uh, perspectives. And whether they were on, on kind of more luxurious scale as was the original project of Block 30, or on the much more modest scale of, of the actual apartments that were, that were built, these ideas were still very consistently applied in, in practice through uh, the design of uh, apartments. I want to say that uh, this uh, combination of open plan and real rigorous functionalism was perhaps not really a coincidence. First, it was obviously the result of the degree uh, to which modernist culture was embedded among Belgrade architects. Uh, but also I want to draw attention to uh, the construction system that underlay many, not all, but many of the examples that, that I showed, which is the IMS system, uh, Zhezhen. Uh, pre-stressed skeletal system, uh, less globally common than the large panel systems, whether, whether east, east or west. Uh, I, I want to argue that EMS Zhezhel was a direct heir to uh, Le Corbusier's Maison Domino, right? This, this uh, sort of uh, theoretical tool, the, 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 the ideal uh, that Le Corbusier posed in, in 1914, 1915, um, as uh, 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 trying to exploit the potentials of reinforced concrete skeletal structure for the creation of complex and flexible uh, apartment uh, plans. In many ways, uh, this, this Maison Domino was the germ uh, from which uh, the idea of open plan uh, uh, developed right later on uh, in the, in the uh, 1920s. The creator of 
uh, the MS Zhezhel system was, was the ingenious engineer Branko Zhezhel, uh, uh, whom we see on the screen, who, who designed uh, uh, the, the hall one of the Belgrade Fair that you see on the right, which was the largest dome in the world at the time, right? In, you know, in Yugoslavia, just uh, coming out of World War II uh, and the, the war destruction, uh, being able to produce the largest dome in the world, I mean, must have been an incredible sign of, 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 of a source of, of, of pride. Uh, and uh, the person responsible for this for, was, was uh, uh, Zhezhev himself. Zhezhev was also the founder of the Institute for the Testing of Materials, right, EMS Institute, which, however, over time, uh, uh, also allowed for its subsidiary institution to to emerge the the center for for uh, housing uh which uh operated for uh almost for a good decade and a half as one of the prime research institutions in which many of the actors that we see saw in the in the, in the, in the captions to projects uh were were uh related uh the fact that Zhezhen was not even an architect and yet played such an important role in this, in this kind of uh, 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 emergence of the Belgrade School of Residential Architecture, I, I think is perhaps a good reason to go back to my original argument about the Belgrade School as, as a design uh, ecosystem, uh, which also raises the questions of uh, the um, uh, authorship. Who is the who is responsible for uh, the invention of the Belgrade department, and who uh, is the creator of the Belgrade School of Residential Architecture? And I think we're getting here to a very interesting uh, notion of potential collective authorship, which is something that in, in uh, architecture theory has been and history has been raised recently. Um, we have been talking about, you know, uh, historians and, and theorists have been moving away from that kind of uh, traditional celebration of the uh, uh, a single uh, uh, unique architectural genius as the sole uh, person responsible for the architectural design. We're starting increasingly to acknowledge the uh, the role of institutions, of, of collective uh, offices. Kimberly has written about that in the context of the socialist world, but also colleagues uh, uh, in, the, in, uh, uh, in the West have been talking about and, and writing about uh, the emergence of large corporate offices that, that produced uh, the uh, 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 architectural uh, designs. And what we see here in the case of Belgrade School is in a way a form of collective authorship but a very interesting and very unusual form of uh, collective uh, authorship that, uh, that offered a, a different path, right? Belgrade Department uh, or Belgrade School was an entire design culture uh, that, uh, that, that uh, came through collective agency, uh, but it was heavily decentralized and yet it still allowed individual figures to acquire prominence and to acquire uh, names. So we still see these, these individual names, right? Uh, whether Lojanic or Tsagic or Marusic or uh, Boronic or Stepanovic and others, right? They, they are the, uh, still the individually identifiable uh, figures that, that uh, clearly contributed uh, to this. So to wrap my presentation, I want to argue that perhaps the biggest uh, uh, achievement of this Belgrade school was to balance out the uh, the need for collective action and collective provision of, of, of goods through collective action and the need uh, for individual identity and, and specificity. Whether we talk about identifiable names of architects or the apartments that could be uh, adjusted and adapted to uh, one's uh, individual needs. And I'm way over time. I apologize uh, for this. Uh, and I'm going to stop uh, right here. So thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you, Vlada. This was, this was really inspiring um, and uh, comprehensive in a way. And uh, it's very hard, you know, being uh, uh, also a professional in this environment uh, to somehow restrict myself now for continuing, you know, the discussion on these issues, <laughs> uh, which are, of course I'm not going to do this moment, you know. Otherwise, this discussion can unwrap in uh, all unforeseen directions, you know, at the moment. So, um, before we actually uh, sum the whole thing up, I would um, I would uh, like to 
sort of point out some uh, themes that we raised during the, those three um, uh, speaks and uh, make uh, some kind of um, of, a, of a, a common ground for the potential questions that are going to come from the other uh, our our general public. Uh, so what we are basically trying to do the whole time now, uh, we are we are dealing uh, the and please Tanya, you know, uh, just jump in whenever you whenever you think you're uh, uh, you need this to to, to correct me. Um, we are assessing, you know, some positive and some negative things that we learned from the from the architecture of modernism during the socialist period throughout the world, basically, and at the same time. We are trying to find out the uh, the reasons why it, it is as it is, and we try out to to, to somehow comparing all those architectures uh, throughout the, the the world. We are trying to to find the reasons why this kind of architecture is more successful in one areas and less successful in other areas, uh, but at the same time based on the same principles and the same uh, construction techniques. And uh, uh, at the end, we have um, Vlada Kulic uh, uh, lecture, basically, who tries to explain the specificity of the Belgrade architectural scene of that time, which uh, introduces some uh, interesting elements that we cannot find at, the, at an other uh, 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 architecture of the social period of time or the other parts of the world. So it's, a, it's, it's basically a setup on which we can raise so many questions and try to find so many answers. So before we start doing that, I'm asking, you know, if anybody has uh, anything to ask now at the moment. Uh, uh, before we uh, let uh, our audience to, uh, to uh, post questions, um, I would like for uh, three of our participants to comment on each other presentations uh, and uh, uh, I know that uh, Kimberly and Vlada and I participated uh, probably 10 years ago in uh, one panel in which the question of uh, Czechoslovakian architecture in relation to Yugoslavian architecture uh, had been raised. And that's why I probably I put that uh, in my in my introduction to the exhibition catalog. Uh, that, that would be one question, one direction into our discussion can go. And I think Vladimir Lojanica uh, also pointed out to the fact, uh, as well as Vlada Kulic, uh, that we all believe in specificities, in values, and superiority of Belgrade School of Architecture. And I think Vlada Kulic to some extent try to explain why. Uh, but you know, now after this presentation, uh, I don't know if I would uh, keep on teasing Kimberly uh, to admit that we are better, you know, it's, it's not your <laughs> song. We are not going to have the winner in the end. Uh, and uh, the other thing is uh, we might not know enough because we are raised in really this culture of enthusiasm towards housing architecture, believing it's good. So whenever we, uh, we, we go abroad, either to the United States or to Czechoslovakia, we always say, wow, look at this crappy apartment. <laughs> did, did they, didn't they have Professor Lojanica, the father of this, uh, uh, this person next to me, to teach them how to make a decent apartment? <laughs> no, that that's our reaction. Oh, when I when I uh, when I start buying the apartment in the United States, I will say, "How am I going to buy this? They spend one thousand square one thousand square foot on nothing." I was angry because you know that the way uh, uh, American architects, for example, deal with space. If you are not dealing with three thousand square foot uh, uh, square foot, you, you don't know how, where to start from. And that would be my comment on all comments. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll try to keep my mouth shut. <laughs> <laughs> Florian, do you want to start with the comments now that you're settled in a one spot? It's nice to see you. 
Thank you very much. I saw. I see that you saw my my entire travel through Scotland. Yeah. Yes. I mean, I found I found your your point, Kimberly, extremely interesting. I mean, you started out the whole mass housing discussion with Carol Teige quoting Friedrich Engels, basically that the market can never provide acceptable housing for the entire population. That is a truth that is so far unrefuted. So. And as a matter of fact, I would rather say most of the world have a rather strong uh, or um, a stronger uh, intervention into housing on the side of the state. This is, in a, in a way, the US are somehow a, an, an, an exception there or an important exception, including some many other American countries. But what I would like to, and the other point that I got from, from, from you, Kimberly, which I found extremely uh, Im important is also that um, it's not really anymore about the discussing whether we, we need multi-story housing or rather single family housing. I mean, it is totally clear that the, the growth of the population at the world level cannot be uh, accommodated in a single family housing uh, uh, model. And, and mo in most countries, this is also not the case. I mean, the, the countries that experienced the, the biggest growth, like China, India, and so on, I mean, in single family housing is just out of question. And no matter how rich you are, I mean, it's not even a question of class or of wealth. So, so in the, at that level, I find it is quite important to discuss what are the differences. And uh, if we now look at Belgrade, I mean, from, from us who are not so familiar with the Yugoslav context, obviously uh, Yugoslavia is often lumped together with the whole of Eastern Europe in that it is a country of high standardization of you know panel buildings and this is sort of somewhat collectively dismissed so uh, Vlada's pointing out of the qualities of the Belgrade School of Architecture is somewhat a counterweight and an important counterweight for that so my question to Vlada, or basically to, 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 to all of you, would, 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 would be if there is a tradition that went beyond the end of the uh, socialist regime or beyond the end of Yugoslavia that continued. I mean, um, uh, Kimberly had made, made the other point in, 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 the, uh, in Czechoslovakia, say, well, a lot that, that, that made Czechoslovakia interesting and that made the, the even the panelaki interesting was a tradition that came from the pre-war period now we can say the same thing is there something that is now like a continuation of the bell great school very close tradition just whatever swept away and now people are doing something different i would be interested in talking about that or hearing about that do you want to start there, Vlada? Vlada, yeah. Sure. Uh, well, I, I'm not perhaps the best person to answer that question because uh, I, I haven't uh, studied uh, the answers very, very clearly. Uh, and I might be uh, uh, missing uh, uh, something that may have emerged in the, in the more recent years. Uh, you know, this very event is, is in a way a legacy of that, right? That, that there's this lingering understanding that this is something that, something valuable that was produced at the at at the time but there was a time in the in the 2000s uh when uh, uh housing construction sort of uh, uh, took off to some degree again uh that made me curious to look uh into into uh, those buildings and there were all kinds of problems that plagued uh the new construction right from uh, from uh not the most rigorous design right so you know when I, I found really appalling apart, uh, apartment plans, right, where you see columns in the middle of, of uh, living rooms, etc. To the famous example of those poisonous toxic buildings, right, where where uh, some kind of uh, uh, toxic paint was used, uh, and the building became uh, completely uninhabitable. So my sense from a distance is that uh, uh, in practice, right, and it's now again you know about the socio-political system more than architecture that the 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 the, the, the kind of the com commercialization of, of construction and the production of architecture uh in many ways dismissed this 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 legacy and that much of the knowledge 
uh, was was forgotten. There were, of course, there, there are pockets, right, of colleagues. I mean, including you know us here, right? The, the, this, the, this event uh, testifies to that. That are absolutely aware of the importance of this of this of this legacy. But I think there's a disconnect with what's actually happening on the ground in the design, which is now completely commercialized and subjected to the logic of, of the market and fastest possible production uh, for for uh, profit. So uh, I will I will stop here because I think there are probably more competent people to to respond to this uh, 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 here, uh, including the moderators. Okay, thank you. Well, if I may add something to that uh, to that point, um, I will just start by uh, saying that only last year uh, there has been a um, 700,000 square meters of erected um, residential architecture in Belgium during one year. So it's a massive production. And um, uh, I will just um, uh, go on with the, with, the, with, the, with, the, with the base that Vlada uh, set uh, in terms of, of some kind of the discontinuation of the, of the positive tradition that we had at the Belgrade School of Architecture. And, uh, the idea is that from this period of, of socialism, where we have uh, collectivity and collective awareness, and we have where we had then idealism and belief, and where we have a quality, now we have in a neoliberal state of sort of uh, society in which we are today, we have the individuality, we have the sort of atheism, and we have a sort of uh, profit versus the quality. So basically, when you you know uh, have a look at those facts, I mean you get the answer why the, the seven hundred thousand square meters are not even close to what uh, in quality to what they were you know once uh, in in those in those periods that you're thinking about. Uh, but I just had to 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 you know to uh, to make some uh, discourse for the uh, for, from there because not all of the architecture that was produced nowadays are bad. So it, this is not what I'm saying. I'm saying about the majority and about the, the average production. Uh, we still do have uh, a very beautiful examples of, uh, of the residential architecture, but the percentage is what's killing us at the moment. So uh, maybe I'll pick up on a couple things that from the comments. I think <clears throat> for me, the Czechoslovak example and Vladimir, you mentioned that uh, I'd be interested to think about how the standardization figures into the conversation. And of course I am. Um, and I think the, there's, a, there's one line in a book by Rostislav Shvaka that I've, I have been thinking about for many years. It's from like, the book's from like 1995. But he mentions that one reason that they went to this, the standardization kind of hardened and increased is that the panel factories became a very strong political lobby in Czechoslovakia and they protected their interests in this conversation. So in other words, in the 50s, late 50s and 60s, I found maps of a whole series of panel factories that were built all across Czechoslovakia and they made panels of a certain size, right? And with panelocks, those panels are the walls, the floors, everything that I mentioned. and those factories then became essentially an actor in your diagram that had a political power to stop a lot of experimentation with other systems. And you find imports of Danish systems and other kinds of one-off systems that were tried in individual uh, examples in Czechoslovakia, but they were not picked up at the mass scale because there was this desire essentially to keep using the infrastructure they had built for the panels. And, you know, I think your diagram, uh, which we'll have a chance to talk about, I hope, soon together since, you know, because I love this kind of mapping and my new research includes this kind of mapping. So um, to think about in your diagram, a boundary line or a color code that has to do with actors who were fully within control of the state and actors that were not fully within control of the state, because we can do a similar diagram for Czechoslovakia, of course, and you know we'll talk about that because I'm very interested. I think what would happen is those names would tuck inside of 
some of your other shapes. So there'd be fewer free floating actors in the in the diagram. That's what Czechoslovakia looks like, but all the other players are there. And because those people get tucked into these other organizations like Stavo Project, which was the, the major design institute, the boundary line between state actor and independent actor changes. And that to me is the interesting question. Yugoslavia is the only country I know about enough to say this, that there was truly a kind of independent market for design services that did not exist at a, in an open kind of, um, I don't want to call it sanction, but in an open way that was part of the ecosystem. You know, in Czechoslovakia, there was there were architects doing private commissions, but it was all kind of under wraps and behind the scenes and not promoted as one of the one of the pieces. And so the the question of what's within the state's control, you know, and what's outside of the state's control, this is where I would place the Belgrade School in an interesting mm -hmm. space, right? Because um, mm -hmm. the fact that everything is within the state's control in Czechoslovakia, the building construction companies, the material producers, the design work services themselves are produced within these state design institutes. You, you cannot as an individual have any agency to say, I want to experiment with this other kind of system, right? Because all the inputs from the other parts of the ecosystem are directing you to limit your, your range of action. And so I think that the, um, the ability to use a stick system just to be very kind of crude about it. You know, this is in 1940s Czechoslovakia, this is the dream. You know, they're, they want socialist architecture to be made with the Le Corbusier stick domino house system at, you know, prefab, but they, they want to have the free plan, free facade. You know, they, uh, they, they want all of the things that the Belgrade School were, were able to bring into the mass production. It just became impossible because of the way that the entire economy was set up. Um, and so, you know me, I, I always love talking economics. And I, I think that part of the, this is really interesting. And I have so much to say about the capitalist piece, but I don't wanna say too much. So we can kind of keep going on it, but the, the profit motive of, of real estate right now everywhere um, changes all of the dynamics of the, of the the agency of the architect. Th this is what I would argue. Absolutely, and if I may just follow up on, on that. I think your, your point about, about, about the, the economic con uh, framework is, is incredibly important, right? Because I think it, it ultimately underlies uh, the outcome of the question of success or failure, right? To, to go back to what Florian was, was uh, mentioning uh, earlier. Uh, uh, absolutely, right? The, the uh, you know, who controls the purse uh, controls the entire system, right? And the fact that uh, in Yugoslavia, it was not really the state. It was never the central federal state that controlled the purse, even though there were powerful federal institutions like the army, but it was a much more complex mix, right? The, the state itself was greatly decentralized. There were also economic enterprises that, that, were, that were important uh, 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 investors with their, their own agency and their own uh, motivations and agendas, right? I, I think that's what allowed this ecosystem uh, to, to uh, emerge. And just to make the comparison, right, to, to the United States, right, where, where uh, we would never imagine, right, that, this, that the role of the state would actually be so prominent. But those, those examples that are typically touted as failures, right, most famously Pruitt-Igo, right? But, but there are others in, in, in Chicago that, that Florian writes, wrote about, et cetera. There was actually a, a federal central state funding as well as, uh, as, as funding. It, it came from the state, right? Very ironically, unlike in, in uh, Yugoslavia. And when the state withdrew the funding for that, right? For maintenance, for example, most famously Pruitt-Igo, right? That is, that, that's been widely written about uh, the project failed. And just to follow up on, on what, what Florian said, I completely agree with, 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 with his, his uh, uh, sort of the, the picture that he paints. It's not about architecture, right? It is about the wider dynamics, social and economic dynamics that, that determines how, how architecture is inhabited. And in that sense, we really, uh, as architects, we need to get off of our high horse and, 
can reconcile with the fact that that it's not us who uh, ultimately determine the success or or, or failure of, of architecture because it is part of a much much wider system, right? So that Le Corbusier, Corbusian idea that the architect is a is a prophet a prophet who can who can uh, save the world uh, does not does not uh, apply. Nevertheless, when there are conditions, architects, as I think Belgrade School demonstrates, absolutely do have the agency to 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 make a difference, right? Because uh, you know, other parts of Yugoslavia uh, uh, explored housing, but in different ways. It was not the apartment that was the that was the center of the, of the attention. And I think this is where the uh, kind of that very very fine, very subtle question of the of, of the power of the architect to to make a difference uh, becomes kind of very uh, uh, kind of clearly focused. Thank you, Vlada. We'll take a couple of questions from the audience. One uh, uh, related to, to Kimberly uh, just uh, said a couple of minutes ago, uh, the discussion about uh, the future of housing, and I think Florian also referred to the future of housing, and of course uh, uh, the future of housing within this uh, uh, context of, uh, of, uh, of the neoliberal uh, economy. Uh, so the question will is uh, what is the future of, of housing and how could we stop the investment in empty flats uh, that is uh, used only for rents? Do you see a new paradigm of architecture? Housing architecture. Well, uh, Kimberly, would you like to answer? No, you start this one. It's, that yeah. one. it's a very general question and the part yeah about the rent i don't particularly understand uh, what is the future of housing i mean a few things are are, are very clear i mean housing has to be multi-story <laughs> at a world level because of climate emergency and so on we won't go back from standardization although the panel has run its course we will we probably won't have new panel buildings but some form of standardized buildings will continue and architects will work with that and in that respect, I always want to point out that at not that just the Eastern European uh, architects were the, the masters of standardization. I mean, a lot of that you have in the Western countries as well. So this will stay as well. I would like to point to the fact that um, Kimberly mentioned before, the, the power of the, um, of the panel factories in socialist countries. The two socialist countries I have researched, East Germany and uh, Poland, had the same setup. It was also, they were big powers and actually continued their work against the criticism. By the 1980s, the critics were in the majority and panel had already run its course, but there was no return from this without basically having the whole system crumble, which we all know happened in 1989. Now, if you look in, at East Germany, that's a little different because then you had like West Germany investing and the state investing. But if you look at Poland, um, there was a continuation of multi-story building by successively more private housing associations, which were still not capitalist in an American sense, but obviously were included um, more and more market elements. I, it didn't spark a renaissance of architectural creativ creativity, I have to say. It's not that this was the glorious period of like a new architectural renaissance in terms of, of multifamily housing. And I probably would say the same holds true to most Eastern European countries. So what, what went wrong? <laughs> So um, I'm going to pick up on the question of the rent uh, that Florian was saying. You're not sure what it means. I think that what our our uh, audience is asking about is the speculative real estate market that's overproducing real estate, and then it's not intended to be for people to live in, but it's intended as a as a vehicle for tax. Like you use, it's an investment vehicle. It happens to be an apartment, but you buy it the same way you buy a piece of art or something like that. You have no 
your investment is not in housing as a human right or housing as a community effort. It is simply a piece of property and you make back your investment by renting it at a higher cost than what you pay on your mortgage each month, you know? So in other words, it's a profit different driven, um, question is that that's how I took that question. And I, I will say that this is something that preoccupies me personally as an American in this conversation where, you know, our system here in the United States has, I would say, sort of infected other parts of the world because we've always had housing here that was driven by the real estate market, right? You know, from the 18th century uh, in the United States, there was never state investment in housing. And the only time was for about 10 years in the 1950s, which is when Vladimir was talking about that. I mean, in at, to actually be the owners of the, you know, to, to directly fund housing. Instead, in the United States, everything has been set up through government um, subsidized banks and through taxation and sort of uh, giving real estate developers really good tax breaks, which increases their profits. So the the we could say that the whole question of housing in the United States, whether it's government subsidized or not, it's always been a profit motive related to housing. And it has not been a a public good or a collective good model for housing. So this is what I think has has unfortunately started to spread across the world, which is that real estate development is very lucrative. You know, we Vladimir and I had an interview that ended up with the title of our president is a real estate developer a couple of years, like in 2019, because Donald good. Trump's uh, political power um, was driven out of all of the what I would call a kind of criminal enterprise of real estate development in the United States um, through bankruptcies and all sorts of stuff. Like we allow the real estate development interest industry to be a bad actor and people see how much you can make in that, that sector of the economy. It's not a high risk sector of the economy actually, because you, you uh, have so many backstops through the, the banking system to not lose a lot of money. And so, Anyway, I, what I want to say about it is I feel personally that until the conversation can shift from housing as a form of an investment opportunity back to something where we understand housing as part of society and a, and a public good, that, that the reason that we need more housing is not about who can make money from it, but in fact that we should want people to have a decent standard of living. You know, we're so far away from that, at least in the United States. Um, and it's, you know, it's very shocking when you really start to kind of deeply think about it uh, personally for, for me too, even though this is the only thing I've ever known. I've lived in Europe a little bit, but this is my home. I have been here almost, you know, more than 45 years in the United States. And so I, I think, you know, not a lot of people here are thinking about this. They don't understand that this is at the root of our homelessness problem and our housing problem. Uh, we have a yeah. problem here, Kimberly. The problem is that we all agree on what you have just said, and I couldn't agree more. I don't think it's all the Americans' fault. I mean, <laughs> in the United Kingdom, it wasn't because of Ronald Reagan. I mean, we had our own people who started the financialization of the housing market. But I do see in a lot of countries, including Germany and including particularly Scotland, though, where I live, that actually state investment into housing is becoming, uh, is appearing on the agendas of political parties. I don't know if you know, we have an, um, a Scottish election in two weeks and it is actually a huge topic. So there is hope that this changes. Good. <laughs> this yeah, is good if, news. I, if I if I may <laughs> follow up on that, uh, uh, you know, just put it to put it uh, what Kimberly said in good good old Marxist terms, right? It's about housing as exchange value, exchange value versus housing as use value, right? And you know, just by, by being able to translate it in, in such kind of obvious Marxist terms, right? It it points out that the question is fundamentally political, right? Uh, uh, and and that uh, uh, which is not to say that architects have no agency because architects are always citizens as well and and can can take uh, political action right but uh, the uh, the agency is not in the design but uh, in in political uh, engagement right uh, 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 in, in the struggle for for the shift of perspective of sh shift of motivation and 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 uh, orientation. Um, but to add to that, Vladimir, I think, 
you know, one thing that I try to teach our students here in Iowa is that when an architect adds value to a commercial project through good design, the, the, the benefit of that primarily goes to the investor through the sort of higher price of the, the in our current model, you know, the, the value of design is in the price that the real estate can can bring on the market and that students need to be thinking about what are the ways to quantify or talk about the value that architecture has that is beyond the, the profit to the client because you know like you said we're all citizens we want to be in a, you know we want to be in a beautiful world a, a comfortable world we you know we want to kind of improve the environment and you can do that through design but it usually gets written out of the budget if the if you can't prove to the client that they're going to make some money on it right and so part of yeah. the training for the students is to give them the vocabulary and the mindset to understand that they have to think beyond just making an economic argument and making more of a social argument because right now everything is at least in the midwest the the, the market for design services is very focused on like brand and value added and profit and all of this stuff. Yeah, that, that's precisely what I'm saying. Uh, that there's, there has to be understanding that, that uh, there's a, 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 a kind of social responsibility, but that is, 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 is now acting politically rather than narrowly architecturally, right? And, yes. and awareness absolutely needs to be cultivated. Uh, guys, I just uh, need to stop you there at the moment. Thank you very much. We have a couple of more minutes and a couple of more questions from the public. So if you... Um, uh, I, I, I just saw this question from Ivana, which I find interesting. And yeah. which... I, okay. But uh, uh, can we do first the first question coming from uh, Professor Kadirić uh, to Vladimir Kulic directly. Vlada, can you see the question? Yes, yes, absolutely. So the question is, uh, if, uh, thank you very much for, for, for that question. Nice, nice to see you today. Uh, yes, absolutely. You know, as I said, this, this, this sort of chart that I gave was not exhaustive in any way. And yes, I would say that the Museum of Applied Arts played a really, really important role, you know, I, uh, especially by, by staging the exhibitions of competitions, right? And, and the architects were telling me, I remember Millennium Art telling you how they they always used to go to these competitions to see uh, uh you know what what the participating other participating architects uh did and learn from them right and to to kind of see where where the uh where the research of of apartments uh, uh apartment design went so absolutely thank you thank you for for mentioning that uh i you know i literally just made this chart last night as a way to sort of clarify my my thoughts, uh, and and it's it's far from exhaustive. It's a sketch, but absolutely, yeah. The, there's the cultural institutions uh, should certainly uh, be added uh, to uh, the uh, the ecosystem. Okay, thank you, uh, Florian. Do you think you can uh, maybe continue? Uh, the, uh, well, if if I if if I understand it correctly, it's basically what 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 we can learn from in in, in which. In which sense is functional architecture still viable, or what aspects of functionalist architecture of this 1960s architecture are are still okay? Well, the standardization and the inflexibility is certainly not among them. I think what we can learn from them is is actually the 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 uh, well the the advantages of planning of certain planning. Because you have an institute, basically an institution that sets the, um, the, the parameters of the city, uh, which looks at the bigger context, which not just at one sub subdivision, and this is all in here in functionalist planning. So if you want to plan for, 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 for public transport, that is something that is doable. And you certainly the values of density and of multi-story housing can also be learned from 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 this because this has to be the future. And uh, I think the one thing that should be tackled is the inflexibility of these spaces because the the big point in which nineteenth century architecture has been superior to 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 functionalist nineteen sixties architecture is the is that it has stand the, the test of time in the sense of being adaptable 
to different family types, to different work uh, um, life balances, to different models of social cohabitation and so on. And I'd like to follow up on that. I think that's a very important point. And we are seeing sort of a newer interpretation now uh, of, of, of this modernist functionist architecture of the 50s, 60s, 70s, uh, sort of becoming reinterpreted in modern terms currently. I think it's a very important year this year uh, because the winners of the Pritzker Prize uh, are like a ton of Vassal, right? The, the French office that made its career by, by adapting and, and making more flexible precisely these standardized uh, functionalist uh, uh, buildings by never uh, uh, going uh, far beyond the aesthetic of the original building, but, it, but by simply adapting them to new standards and, and, and new spatial needs and, and, and the need for, for greater flexibility and, and, and spatial qualities and openness. So I, I think in that sense, uh, uh, that, that kind of uh, a, a moment gives me a bit bit of of, of hope, uh, right? That that uh, there will be also a kind of new creative uh, push, uh, an ethic among the architects uh, to engage with with this enormous housing stock that was inherited from the modernist period that does not necessarily need to be replaced at a tremendous environmental cost, but can actually be brought. Uh, up to date uh, to become uh, uh, livable and uh, attractive again. And, so I'm going to I'm going to try to take these last two questions together. Is that okay? This yeah? is what we wanted to. Yeah. to okay. <laughs> so I'll I'll try to answer together. I think that for me the one of the worst parts of contemporary design is the poor understanding of window placement and window size and also of the sun. So I think that one thing that practicing architects could do is to have a better understanding of airflow, operable windows, views out of their apartment units and in which direction. I've always been so impressed when Vlada Kulic talks about these apartments in which as you look down the corridors, they always end in windows. And if you think about a contemporary apartment, this just does never happens, especially in my experience in the United States. The, the developers punch a hole in the wall and stick a window and that's it. And I think that's a really missed opportunity the other thing that designers should be doing that would I think would help is better storage. So one of the great things about socialist apartments and, and socialist living in my understanding is that people accumulated fewer things and they also had ways to store those things, you know, through uh, either closets or these big stand up like kind of piece of furniture that was a closet um, that the checks I know have everywhere. And I think a lot of developers in the United States don't think about storage as an architectural design element of the unit. And this is a great way to maximize space because square feet is not always the way that you define a great apartment. You can have a big empty room that doesn't have a lot of windows, doesn't have a lot of storage, and that room doesn't function any better than if it would be half the size. And so for me, that like the, the questions of storage and of light, these are the big things that, that I think change a, an average apartment into a, a really good apartment. So the Belgrade apartment, right? Well, I've never seen one in person. I've only heard you talk about it. But, you know, we're looking at everyone's books behind them, right? Uh, we need to store our things. And so there's a kind of, I, I guess I'm just saying an attention to how the walls are used, where the openings are, where the light is coming in, how the furniture works. I think this is all something that contemporary designers could do better. Um, and maybe the very last thing about that, in the socialist period, the range of options for furniture in particular were constrained, but they were also part of the thinking. Like the, the way you designed a unit, like Vladimir, when you're showing the Belgrade apartments, those tables and the different kinds of furniture, there was a sense of what those could be because they came from suppliers that were known, right? And you had a lot of furniture or some furniture in the MoMA show that really showed off the high quality of the furniture design. That's another problem these days is furniture quality is so bad and the, the best furniture is so expensive. And so you, you don't have a reliable source of kind of good, modest 
furniture that is convertible and, and good for storage and all that, except for Ikea. And Ikea, you know, it's been kind of overexposed and also environmentally not a very uh, good company from what I understand, like the materials they use and the labor practices. So I don't know if anyone wants to pick up on that, but. <laughs> Okay, um, I'm afraid uh, we have uh, only just enough time for one last question coming for uh, Vlada Kulic again from Alexandru Zahaira. Can you can you see the question, Vlada? And then yes, I actually I was afraid we would run out of time, so I started typing the answer, but I can okay, okay re respond. Uh, yes, I th there were there were. Uh, 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 attempts to uh, engage with with vernacular traditions, especially in the eighties, uh, and then thinking also of so so following up on 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 block nineteen a right and that that uh, idea of of kind of the the prefabricated structure resembling um, uh, a wooden skeleton right and the placement of windows of traditional houses etc. Yes, this became sort of an, an interesting mini trend in the eighties. I'm thinking of architects like like uh, Brana Mitrovic right. Uh, uh, and Marusic is as, as well, but I'm really not aware that this this uh, continued uh, to today, except for maybe here and there in, in occasional projects, even uh, hotels in Koponik, etc. Right. So so there was a uh, kind of this this wider interest in vernacular architecture. You should talk about your book in this context, your postmodernism book. Oh, okay. Yes. Well, you know, I'm not sure how much it applies, but yes, uh, the the ideas, you know, of traditional architecture were uh, uh, combined in the other contexts as 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 well in 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 uh, large scale mass housing, for example, in places like from the Soviet Union to 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 Hungary uh, to cent, you know Central Asia, right, where where the attempts to incorporate. Uh, the, the ornament and colors that are associated with traditional culture uh, absolutely made uh, 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 kind of made their way into mass uh, housing panel prefabricated uh, construction, right? So, so uh, yes, both both uh, the uh, specifically the Hungarian context, uh, Virag Molnar in 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 in, in, in the, my uh, edited book on uh, socialist postmodernism uh, does does write about that extensively. Right uh, about about this this sort of revival of nationalist vernacular uh, tradition. Thank you very much for this answer, and I would like now to say goodbye to everybody. <laughs> unfortunately, <laughs> can I make one quick last comment before we go? Yeah, I, I just... <laughs> I want to say that Vladimir and I are here together at Iowa State, and we would love to host students if anyone wants to come as a master's student, as a Fulbright, any kind of research fellowship, we're here and we're at the same place. And so we, we really hope that we'll start to see some interest for students to come over and, and hang out with us for a bit. Yes, and we're even developing an online master's program, so we might even be able to do that uh, at a lower cost and without the need to relocate to Midwest. So yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but just write to us if you have questions about Bla that. blatant blatant advertisement. But yes, yeah. please, yes. <laughs> we would like to invite everybody to come to Belgrade, see yes. the examples of Belgrade School of Housing because I say goodbye to everybody and thank you to everybody again. Thank you, thank very, you very much. Nice to see you, Florian. Thank you very much, Tanya. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.